want to welcome you to our 9.30 a.m. Sunday service from Doctrine Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama, and we thank you for visiting with us. We're still in the state of Alabama. We're still under um, uh, a, an edict that uh, we can't assemble uh, within our church, and so we bring this to you uh, through our internet service ministry, and, and we hope that it's as beneficial to you as it is to our church members that uh, who we have steadily been able to keep a current in our feeding their souls with the word of God. And that is what we're thrilled about, about the Internet. Couldn't have happened without the Internet. What a wonderful thing that is. Uh, you know, there's always, a, there's always a rainbow in the midst of a great storm, isn't there? And, uh, and for us... Uh, the internet has been this wonderful rainbow in the midst of a of a storm. Uh, the ability to be able to send it out to our people, who uh, are in an edict to stay home, uh, and not only that, but this has affected uh, uh, the whole world. And so we send a, a message of encouragement to you, everywhere in the world, that uh, you pick up on us out of DoctrineStudies.com. Well. During the month of April, and then I want to do an introduction, then we have prayer. Uh, during the month of, of April, we've been studying uh, a series called Messianic Passover because I wanted to show uh, the four holidays, Jewish holidays, national holidays that were connected uh, to the first advent of Jesus Christ, his incarnation coming into the world, dying on a cross, being buried and raised from the dead. Um, and these four hot Jewish holidays, now there are seven, three of them deal with the second coming. The four I'm talking about deal with the first coming of Christ. And what's important about these four holidays, they have rules and regulations to them. We're looking at them from Leviticus 23. And he must fulfill, Jesus said, I came, uh, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. So not only does he have to die on Passover, be buried, be buried it during unleavened bread um, for three days, and be resurrected the first day after the weekly Sabbath of unleavened bread, ascend back to the Father, and on the 50th day of his resurrection, Pentecost, called the Feast of Weeks. Now, the important is, and so he does that. He, he fulfills these four holidays in his first advent. But listen, not only ha does he have to fulfill the holiday, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Feast of Weeks, we call Pentecost, but he's got to fulfill the law of them. There were rules and regulations to them that had to be obeyed. Not just the holiday, but the rules and regulations of the holiday. In order for him to be the, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. So all of that's kind of important. And we've been talking about it. This, we've been into five lessons, and this will be my final lesson in that series. We'll start a new one after Mother's Day. We'll start a new series. The four, again, the four, Passover, nice and 14. Always, always a date, not a day. Nice and 14. In 30 AD, that was a Wednesday. It just, it was a Wednesday. It didn't just happen to be a Wednesday. It was of necessity it'd be a Wednesday. The very next day, the 15th, goes through the 21st. That seven-day festival is called Unleavened Bread. The first day and the last day, the 15th and the 21st, were holy holidays, holy convocations. Uh, John 1931 called them High Sabbaths. They were viewed like a weekly Sabbath with rules and regulations. In the, in, in, after the first day after the weekly Sabbath of Unleavened Bread was called First Fruits Festival. It was always a day, not a date. Mm -hmm. 
then that's the resurrection of Christ. Then you start counting from first fruits for seven full Sabbath weeks to the 50th day from, from first fruits, you get the Feast of Weeks, what we call Pentecost. The first three of these was fulfilled by Jesus on earth. Or in it. Death, burial, resurrection. Raised from the dead on the third day. However, the last one, Feast of Weeks, was, didn't occur with Jesus on earth. It occurred with Jesus in heaven for him to baptize with the Holy Spirit. Which began the church age and the great mystery of the church dispensationally. And the establishment of a new covenant. The, the establishment of the church age under the new covenant. The church under the new covenant. The people miss all that by not connecting the dots for some reason. Now, Jesus has to fulfill these. Now, look at the great event for true, truly is the, one, the great event, which is a starting point, was the death of Christ on the cross on the hill called Golgotha. That's the starting point. It's a major event, but no more major than three days burial, resurrection, unleavened bread, feast of weeks. In other words, it starts there. It's, he's got to be, he's got to die on a cross, be buried on the third day raised. Then he's got to ascend back to the Father and then send Pentecost. So let's have a word of prayer. And we're going to talk about today the first fruit resurrection, the importance of the resurrection. The importance of the resurrection. Now, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin in a Christian's life. It could be met, caused by mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or vert sins. How do we get out of carnality and back to spirituality of the indwelling Holy Spirit? Galatians 5, 16, 17 says, when I committed sin, it was because I went to the flesh for fulfillment of a, of a desire. A desire of the flesh. Not, a, not, not to be obedient to the desire of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in me. So how do we get out of carnality and back to the spirituality without having to go through salvation again? I confess my sin. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is faith, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That takes us back to verse 7. The work of Christ on the cross is extended to my life, not as an unbeliever, but as a believer by the confession of my sin. It doesn't deal with my salvation. It deals with my spirituality. The power of the Christian life in the church age under the new covenant is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So let's have a word of prayer to give you a privilege. Every believer in the gospel of Christ, you believe that he died for your sins, was buried and raised on the third day. It's called the gospel. When you believe it, it's the power of God to save you. And you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It's the gift of God. For that person that believes that, then confession of his personal sin puts him back into the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you that privilege and for just a moment to confess sin, to be cleansed, to be back into the ministry of the Spirit because in John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit's responsibility in my life is to teach me and to recall the Word of God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the, the wonderful love that God has for us that sent his Son, and his Son had the great love for God for us that he gave himself for our sins in our place, in our stead. 
Hooper plus the ablative for us on our behalf that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What a wonderful exchange occurred for me on the basis of grace. He took away all the 13 judicial charges of Adamic sin and gave to me the 50 things that I could never lose in time and eternity because of the grace of God in salvation. For by grace I am saved through faith and not of myself. It is a gift. I pray today, Father, you would teach us the importance of the first fruit resurrection of Jesus Christ and how it affects our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in our previous lessons, we saw that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He was buried three days and three nights, according to Matthew 12, 38 through 40, John 2, 19 through 22. He spent 40 days of post-resurrection appearances on way to Pentecost. Ten days short of that, he goes back to heaven, ascension and session, seated at the right hand of God the Father. Ten days later, the first act, great act of authority was he baptizing with the Holy Spirit. All of those Jewish believers gathered at Pentecost. The 120 turned into 3,000, 120 according to the book of Acts. And the church was born in the world. And at that time, Christ sent the Holy Spirit. He said, when I go back to the Father, it will be to your advantage. I'm in John 14, 15, and 16. It will be to your advantage, in John 16, it will be to your advantage that I go away. If I don't go away, I cannot send him to you and, of course, the Holy Spirit is the helper, the other helper, Allah, another of the same kind, divinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, to be a responsible for the ministry of the church under the new covenant to the world in what's called the church age. Isn't that wonderful? It should be. It should be wonderful. Now, here's why I'm bringing this lesson to you today. I meet people who say, who never give a clear gospel. And think that it will get people saved. Let me give you an example. Now, you can listen to this on television. You hear it every day. A person will, will have a very clear message of why Christ died on the cross. He died there in our place for our sins. And if you believe that, you can be saved. And they call that the gospel. That is not the gospel. That's only one of three parts. Three people died on the hill of Golgotha the same day under the same criminal ag crime against the state. They all died. On that day, on that hill, on crosses. Which one is the Christ? See, that bothered me. As I, as an unbeliever, that bothered me. And people wouldn't give me clarity on the answers. The only way you know which one of those that died that day is the Messiah is that he rose from the dead on the third day. He has to be in the grave by his own testimony, Matthew 12. He has to be in the grave three days and three nights as Jonah was in the belly of the sea monster. On the, raised on the third day means he spent three days and three nights. Man, that's nice in 15, 16, and 17 in 30 AD. That's Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. On Sunday, we all agree that he's up from the grave. But you see, when Paul explains the gospel to us, he says there's three parts to the gospels. There's Passover, 
unleavened bread and first fruits. And what he means by that is Christ has got to die on a cross. He's got to be buried three days. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday of unleavened bread. And at the weekly Sabbath called first fruits, the next day, the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath, the very next day, the very next day after the weekly Sabbath, Saturday, is first fruits. And it is his day of resurrection. So when people, when people say, well, Christ died for your sins and that's enough to get you saved, it is not enough. It is not the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, uh, 3 and 4 Paul discussing the gospel in verses 1 and 2, describes the gospel as Jesus dies on the cross is buried, and on the third day raised from the dead. He calls that the gospel. You, you've got to have a Savior not just die for you. He's got to go to Sheol for three days and come back and be raised from the dead to be the Messiah. That was his struggle in Gethsemane. Don't leave my soul in Sheol. Psalm 16. Don't leave my soul in Sheol. And God didn't because there's three parts. He dies on a cross. He's buried and he's raised from the dead on the third day. We've discussed this over the last lessons. I'm just reminding you. And he is raised on the Jewish festival of first fruits. Paul identifies that in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Paul refers to the resurrection of Jesus as the first fruits of the dead. The first fruits. You know why he calls it first fruits? The day it occurred. And 50 days later is going to be Pentecost. So, listen to me. <laughs> I hear guys all the time. I mean, some of them don't even, they say, say look, if you, if you believe in Jesus, that he's your savior, and acknowledge to him that you're a sinner, and you want to be part of the family, pray some kind of a prayer, and you'll be in. There's no gospel there. There is no gospel there. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 lays out what the gospel is. Dies on a cross, buried, raised from the dead. That is the gospel. You must believe that. Romans 1, 16. Paul says the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. You know, I get criticized, if you can believe this, I get criticized for preaching that. It's very clearly taught in the Word of God. And let me tell you, I'll take all the hits for that. Because it is the absolute truth. You can't believe in just the death of Christ. You can't believe in just the burial of Christ. You can't believe in just the resurrection of Christ. You have to believe that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. Then he is the Savior. So here's my point. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a big deal. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a big deal. Not only is it a big deal for your salvation, it's a big deal for you too will have a resurrection and you too will have a resurrection body. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a big deal, not only for your salvation, but for the Christian way of life. So let me talk about four things today to try to show you that the first fruits of the resurrection of Jesus Christ was a big deal. Point number one, 
Jesus' resurrection occurs on Nisan 18 during the Unleavened Bread Festival in 30 AD. The first day after the weekly Sabbath, the Jews called it the first day of the week. We call it the first day of the week, but we call it Sunday. The day following the weekly Sabbath. You can read about this, and it has to be fulfilled to be the Messiah. He's got to die on the cross, Passover, be buried during unleavened bread, and raised during unleavened bread in order to fulfill Pentecost. Otherwise, he's not the Messiah. I know <laughs> you have to actually read some things in the Bible that are connected. Leviticus 23, verses 9 through 14. Remember, remember that first fruits is a day, not a date. Now, in John, the 20th chapter, where my study comes from today, John, the 20th chapter, John records the people Jesus appeared to. I just want to deal with the first day of his resurrection. Now, he's going to appear to people over 40 days before he ascends to the Father. But in John 20, verse 1, where he talks about the resurrection, verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week of unleavened bread, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. Now, remember, that tomb had been sealed by a Roman seal. Whoever broke that, be hunted down like a dog and treated worse. So we have Mary Magdalene on the early, on resurrection morning, sunrise services. Paul looks back in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul looked back at the post-resurrection appearances of Christ. And Paul records them in the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 8. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. See, I just talked about 1 through 4 on the gospel. Pay special attention when you go back one day and look at this. If you don't have a study guide, you can get one off from the Internet, off from Doctrinal Studies. It comes with our lesson. But in the meantime, if you didn't have one, go get a pencil and paper in your Bible. <laughs> Come on now. It's Bible study. I mean, you can't play football without a football. You can't play basketball without a basketball. Come on now. Run, get it. In 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 8, pay attention to the word appeared. Pay attention to the word appeared because it's going to show you the people he appeared to in very general terms. Now, where this all began was for John. It all began in John, the 20th chapter. John, the tw first chapter, John 20, 1 through 25. Now, I'm just going to run through that with you a little bit, and you can study it later. The first person that we meet that's involved in the resurrection of Christ, the day of the resurrection of Christ, is Mary Magdalene. John account has Mary Magdalene discovering the empty tomb, but when you read it, she thought that someone had taken Jesus' body away. She left and returned to the disciples and gave that report. That's verses, verses 1 and 2. In verses 3 to 10, Peter and John rush to the tomb and discover also, as Mary said, the body missing. 
verse 9 is really important. It says, for as yet they did not understand the scriptures, Old Testament, that he, Christ, must rise again from the dead. Now, he's been teaching on that in the book of Matthew. He started heavily teaching it from chapter 16 all the way to the resurrection in 28. Starting 16, you're going to go 16, 17, all the way through. From 16 to 28, he has pounded that idea until it became reality. They return, no body. And they don't, they, it has not even dawned on them that he has been raised from the dead. You know why? Because they haven't paid any attention to what does the Bible say. I'm going to read that. What's the Bible say, Peter and John? What's the Bible say? Must the Messiah rise from the dead? What did Christ teach you? Listen, I'm going to read that part again because you missed it. What does the Bible say? That's the answer to your problems. What's the Bible say? For as yet, this is the day of the resurrection. The tomb is open and there's a body missing. Nobody knows why or where. Yet they did not understand the scriptures the Bible, Old Testament, that he must rise again from the dead. It wasn't like they had never been told Matthew 16 through chapter 28. So it wasn't that they hadn't heard. It was that they didn't believe. You go to church, you hear, and you don't believe. You come online with me, you hear, but you don't believe. You know why? Because you don't pay any attention to what the Bible say. Why don't you go back and investigate it? You're like fake news media today. Don't complain about them when you don't do it for yourself. That's the way you approach the Bible. You'd rather take fake news on the Bible rather than read it for yourself and get the truth. I know I'm being a little hard. How is it that, listen, you say, well, I've never heard this before. You have with me if you'd study these five lessons. I will give you evidence upon evidence upon evidence from the Scripture. Peter and John run back. They don't know where. They don't know where the body's gone, and they don't know why it's gone. They should, but they don't. Then we learn in verse 20, 20th chapter of John, 11 through 18, that Mary returned to the tomb, and Jesus appears to her, has a discussion with her, and she goes back and reports what he told her to the disciples. In verse 18, she says, I have seen the Lord and that he has said these specific things to me. And he is, she is relating that to them. Now we're at the evening. That was early morning on the day of the resurrection of Christ. Now we're on the evening of the day of the resurrection of Christ. We're in John 20, 19 through 24. Jesus appears to 10 disciples. Judas Iscariot is dead, and we're told John is absent. Verse 20 says, And when he had said this, had a discussion with them, he showed them his hands and his side, nail-scarred hands and pierced side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw him. Evening. 
It takes a post-resurrection appearance and identity that he was the guy on the cross that was raised from the dead. Three guys were nailed. Listen, three guys had scars in their hands and had, had swords pierced in their side. No, they had their legs broke. Maybe later, poked in the side, that was evidence of death. What came out was evidence of death. Do you suppose on the evening of the first day, of, or the day of the resurrection, that the resurrection of Jesus is a big deal? <laughs> ah, do you suppose it's a big deal? Yeah. Here's point number two. Passover and unleavened bread celebrated leaving Egypt and bondage for freedom of the promised land. Passover and unleavened bread. That's what it, that's what it taught. First fruits celebrated the arriving in the promised land and celebrating the abundant grace blessings of God. You can read about that in Leviticus 23, 9 through 14. Do you see that? First fruits celebrated the beginning of the barley harvest. The beginning of it. Three months later, in the third month, not Nisan is the first, the third month, Sivan, the third month was the Feast of Weeks, which was the end gathering of the great harvest of the barley season. It is the end of the season. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the beginning. He's got to die. He's got to be buried. He's got to be raised from the dead. He's got to go back and be seated at the right hand of God the Father and wait for the 50th day to send Pentecost. Pentecost, the week of feast, is the in-gathering time of first fruits. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the in-gathering of the church. And this will be the in-gathering of believers into the body of Christ, the church. Go therefore into all the world and preach it. The in-gathering is the church age. And when he comes back, it's done. We live in the great period of the ingathering of the harvest, of what the harvest that began when Christ died on a cross, was buried and raised from the dead, when the gospel come become historical reality. There could never, listen, it doesn't matter what we're facing the issue for the church of Jesus Christ is take the gospel to the unbelieving world and preach that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead to give you life everlasting. Be part of the great harvest of ingathering. You think the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a big deal? The whole church age depends on it. Death, burial, resurrection, ascension, session, baptism. He sends, he baptizes the church into existence and he sends the Holy Spirit to operate it, to manage it. He's called the, the another helper in John 14, 15, and 16.
in Leviticus, talking about Leviticus 23.10, in that first fruit section, 9 through 14. In verse 10, he says, When you enter the land which I'm going to give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring in the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. You know what that was? That was shadow Christology of the resurrection of Christ. Now let me tell you something important about shadow Christology of Hebrews 10.1. Hebrews 10, 1. Point number three. The waving of the sheath of first fruits along with the burnt offering. That's at Leviticus 23 on first fruits. The burnt offering had to be a lamb, one year old lamb, without defect. 1 Peter 1, 19 describes Jesus, the Lamb of God, without birth defects and growth defects. You see, to have a resurrection, which is the first fruits, that's what it's all about. You've got to have a lamb that's going to die for the sins of the people. That lamb is going to die. It's going to be buried, and on the third day, he's going to be raised from the dead. That lamb that died, it's going to be raised from the dead to show you there's life after death. I mean, a good life after death. Go to heaven. The waving of the sheath along with the burnt offering, the first fruits, were to give, watch this now, were to give testimony to the believer's acceptability into the presence of God. Their access of accessibility into the presence of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ, he's got to die on a cross. He's got to be buried on the third day, raised from the dead. In order for you to be accepted into the presence of God. You're not going to get it any other way, dear heart. Don't listen to a person lie and damn your soul to hell. I'm telling you the absolute truth. You believe that, you'll be saved. Saved in time and eternity. You say, I don't know about that. Well, Leviticus 23.11 in this passage is dealing with the first fruits holiday. He is to wave the sheath before the Lord so it will be accepted on your behalf. The priest is to wave it on the day after the weekly Sabbath. That's the re Listen, you, what, what did that point to? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, first fruit, is how we're, w how we're accepted into the presence of God. He's got to die. He's got to be buried. He's got to be raised from the dead in order to be, the, one, two, three, in order to be acceptable into the presence of God. He must fulfill all of that or he's not the Messiah. And he did fulfill all of it. And I have preached it and shown it to you. I can't make you believe it. I can only pound it home. The resurrection of Jesus Christ brings the believer into the bountiful grace blessings of God. We record that for you in what's called the 50 things. You go on our website, doctrinestudies.com, and look at for 50 things. You pull it down and you study it. You see what the Bible has to say. It's documented with the word of God. That's what I'm talking about here. He's got to die on a cross. He's got to be buried. He's got to be raised from the dead in order for you to find acceptability in the presence of God. 
And when you believe it, you have acceptability in God. You'll always have acceptability in God because it's based on Jesus' performance and not yours. It's what he did for you, not what you do for him. That gives you accessibility into the presence of God. My, my, my. You know where that was taught? Leviticus 23, 9 through 14, and fulfilled by Jesus during the feast of Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. Now we're waiting for Pentecost. Let me close with point four. Are you getting this? Look. You're going to have to study. You need to get this sheet. You can go online and you can, you can print it out if you've got a printer. Or just keep listening to it until you get it and write it down. But you, listen, you've got to study this. You've got to study. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Now, Paul identified the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the first fruits of unleavened bread. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Then he goes on to give an order in verses 21, 22, and 23. He gives an order to the resurrection, the, the first resurrection. He gives an order to the first resurrection, the resurrection of believers. A dispensational order, by the way. I know you, 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 you've been told by somebody that dispensation is not, I don't care what you call it, call it the church age, I don't, Jewish age, church age, millennial age, I don't care what you call it. There's going to be an order. It's dispensational order. I know. I know. Let me tell you something. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a big deal. It's a big deal. Acts 26, verses 22, 23. So having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to the small and the great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place. This is Paul in court for preaching. That Christ was to suffer, that's the cross, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first fruit to proclaim light both to his people and to the Gentiles. He would be the first to proclaim the gospel to both Jews and Gentiles. Paul said, I stand privileged to you to preach to both of you the same way. Now, I want you to turn in your Bibles for just a moment with me to do an exercise. 1 Corinthians 15. Go ahead. Find, it's New Testament. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 15. Your page is stuck together. Hmm? Your page is stuck together. <laughs> I'm just playing with you. I'm giving you time to look it up. Now, I want you to go down. I want you to start verse 12 with me. We're going to go through 19, but I'm going to show you something really important. Why the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a big deal. Verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? Now he's going to give a debater's technique. He's going to give a, a Greek debater's technique with the word if. In 13, 14, 15, 16, he's going to, give, he's going to use the word if. It's a third-class condition used as a debater technique. Let's assume, let's take your position and assume that there is no resurrection of the dead. When he says some of you, he's talking about in the church. He's writing to the church of Corinth.
where there was false teaching going on, who said the resurrection is not a big deal. It's a first-class condition. This word if, can't see it in the English, but in the Greek, it's a first class. It's used in Greek debater technique. Let's assume you're true. Let's, uh, let, let me look at your argument. Let me show you the fallacy of your argument. So here in verse 13, if, first class condition, let's assume it to be true for the sake of arguing your position, you so how wrong it is. If there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. 14. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain and your faith is vain. See the sequence? Moreover, in verse 15, we are even fall, found to be false witnesses of God because we witnessed against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact, that's another first class, the dead are not raised. Verse 16. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. See, he ran that first argument in 13, 14, 15. He, he used a bridge idea in 16, and he came back in 17, 18, to close it down, and 19 to close it out. If the dead are not raised, not even Christ had been raised. He's back to the original argument. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, and you're still in sin. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. In other words, they're in the same boat they were before they got before they believed. Listen, John 3:16. God sent his son into the world. God so loved the world, he sent his own begotten son into the world. That who would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. In other words, when you believe the gospel of Christ, you were moved from perishing to eternal life. But if you don't believe in the resurrection of Christ, this whole deal is off, and you're still perishing. You're still perishing. What is wrong with you? You see, Paul, Paul what, what, are you nuts? Then he comes to the final one. If we ho have hope in Christ in this life only, we are of all, all men most to be pitied. John 14, 1, in my father's house are many mansions. If it wasn't true, I would tell you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go, I will come again. I mean, he's got to be the greatest liar in the whole world. And that makes me one. It makes Paul one. That's what Paul said. He said, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, our preaching is vain. Your faith is in vain. My, my, my. Listen, let me close with this. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the basis for every church age believer's justification. Justification means declared acquitted from Adam's original sin and made righteous by the grace of God in salvation. That is, believing that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day. You want to read? Write this down, because I'm through. Write this down. Justification, right? Write this down. Romans, the third chapter, 21 through 26. Romans, the fourth chapter, 25. The fifth chapter, verse 1 and 2, and 16. <laughs> Okay, I'll give it to you one more time. Justification based on the resurrection of Christ. 
your justification, the acquittal, in other words, acceptability into the presence of God. Romans 3, 21 through 26. Romans 4, 25. Romans 5, 1 and 2 and verse 16. Just to give, just to whet your appetite. <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. I hope this has been as enjoyable to you as it has been to me. There's nothing I would rather do than preach the word of God. Teach you the, the, the structural evidence of why you should believe it to be the truth. And to put your faith in it. You're going to have to study it. Believe it and cycle it into your soul so that it can become the power, the power to walk by faith and not by sight. And so, Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us on this Sunday. The resurrection is a big deal. There's overwhelming evidence in the Bible Not a jot nor a tittle can be an error. Not a jot nor a tittle. Not a crossing of a T or a dotting of an I. We thank you, Father, for your Son who made it possible to give us accessibility into the presence of God on the basis of grace and that not of herself, salvation is a gift when we believe that your son died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead for our justification. Thank you, Father, for it all in Jesus' name. Amen.